thoughts on this a bit? Um, yeah, well, I'm just just really interested. I didn't realise that, for example, that an element of the e-cigarettes was actually illegal, um, and I find that interesting. I'm not convinced that we want to persuade people to move that way, but I think it's a good interim step. So I think it would be keen to... Uh, I think we do need to do something, but we still need to get people off smoking because it's unhealthy. Yeah, but if, do you agree with Jordan's... Uh, thesis that that we are just hammering the smokers too much and that is causing such undesirable consequences such as attacks on dairy owners? Well, the option for dairy owners is to stop selling the cigarettes, which is going to make it more difficult for people to get them. So, you know, that's an answer. Yeah, I guess, but uh, it's a large part of their profit, of course. Uh, Jordan, thank you. Uh, I thought it was an interesting topic that deserved a bit of an airing, and thanks for coming on today. Thanks, Jim. And there's one more essential question. Can I ask both of you? I mean, if smokers pay for their medical treatment through the taxes we collect from tobacco, which is they always uh, said that they do not overburden the health system disproportionately because they pay so much excise. And if we will all die of something, and tons of people die (laughs) of abusing their bodies in ways we don't tax, then why are we doing it so assiduously with smokers? Because it's idiotic for someone my age, and I have a lot of friends who smoke, and it annoys me to no end that that it's something that's not necessary and proven to be very detrimental to their health and to their families, and that people keep on doing it. And I don't want to... Um, I guess I really passed uh, judgment there really, really harshly. I'm very sorry to all the people who suffer from addiction. But we should be trying to, especially with the younger generations who know the risks of smoking, trying to wean people off it. But... That's counter. Uh, you're sort of arguing against yourself because, on the one hand, you're saying that smokers are paying for it through their taxes, but then suggesting we don't need to tax them. So, hmm. but we do need to tax them, so they are paying for it. So, we do need to tax them from that perspective. All right, uh, two minutes to five. Your personal climate responsibility. I'm wondering if both of you are prepared to make changes in your lifestyles. The University of Manchester reports microwaves across the European Union cause an amount of carbon dioxide to be released into the environment equivalent to 7 million cars. Wow. This this is the first ever comprehensive, said to be, research into the environmental impacts of microwaves, their entire life cycles from cradle to grave. And I could go into the, um, the ways that they don't measure up environmentally, but could you, but with an eye on the clock... Yeah. Could you live without a microwave? I do at the moment. Um, I, not for environmental reasons, but I'm glad to know. I just have moved into a new house and haven't bothered to get one, and it's been going, heat stuff up in the oven, it works great. Okay, but that's a temporary measure. It, 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 um, it also makes me... No, 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 but I just don't have a space for a microwave in my small kitchen anyway. Right. Um, it makes me healthier as well, because most of the food that I eat from a microwave is trash. So um, it's been positive in multiple ways for me not having a microwave. So it's great to hear that it's got environmental benefits as well. Okay, Claire? It'd be a challenge, but probably could do it. You reckon? Yeah. Okay. I've got one more question. A majority of British people support plans for a 25p or half a crown charge (laughs) uh, levied on all drinks sold in disposable cups. 2.5 2.5 billion of the sorts of takeaway cups you get your flat white in are chucked away annually in the UK alone. 2.5 billion, and they wow. are seldom recycled. Yeah. So the next obvious question: Would this make you rethink asking for your coffee in a takeaway cup? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think this is a really interesting thing that I've learned recently. Um, my partner is a greenie, so I'm constantly having to re-establish uh, my lifestyle, and I constantly buy bottled water. That's my problem. Not con- not constantly, but especially when I'm travelling and stuff like that. Yep. And if you're trying to reuse bottles or to use an aluminium bottle, it's really tough to fill it up in like airports and places like that where you're stuck. Yeah. There's not many places that just give you a tap just to, with cold or fresh or clean water to fill it up with. It's not a bathroom or something like that. And it's just interesting how the whole world is structured for you to buy disposable cups and disposable bottles. And yeah, so good point. Yeah. It'd be nice to, to not do that anymore. Last word, Claire? Yeah, I, I'd agree with Guy. So. I agree. About, okay. <laughs> about the disposable. We need to the world with yeah. a bottle. Yeah, the government needs to do better to force us to be better. Yeah. I am 60 and I've never had a microwave oven, says the final texture of the day. Good on you. Uh, that's uh, Guy Williams. Nice to see you. Thanks so much for having me. I love coming on. Welcome back to New Zealand. And Claire Matthews, lovely to have you with us again too, Claire. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Checkpoint with John Campbell coming right up.
RNZ News at five. Kia ora, good afternoon. Ko Katrina Batanaho. The chief coroner is warning people with multiple sclerosis to keep an eye on symptoms worsening in the hot weather after a woman died from overheating in Christchurch. The woman, who had MS and was in her early 60s, died from hypothermia on Wednesday. Laura Tupo reports. Met Service says Christchurch had a high of 32 degrees on Wednesday and is forecast to reach the same high next week. People living with multiple sclerosis can struggle to control their body temperature. The Chief Coroner, Judge Marshall, says people with MS or other illnesses which make them susceptible to overheating should take care. Multiple Sclerosis New Zealand says people can keep their body cool by being in air-conditioned rooms, wearing cooling cotton clothes and drinking more water. Call Laura Tupoaho. Canterbury's Medical Officer of Health says most people with a chronic condition will find it gets worse if they're dehydrated. Dr Alistair Humphrey says older people and children are also particularly at risk from the impacts of heat stress. Prisoners at Rimutaka Prison say they're passing out in unventilated container cells in the hot weather. The Howard League for Penal Reform says it's received complaints from prisoners saying the conditions are horrific. The League's Wellington president, Madeline Rose, says the prison should bring in air conditioning units. The Department of Corrections says it has no evidence prisoners have been passing out in the heat, but it's taking steps to prevent harm to inmates and guards. The Rural Support Trust is describing drought conditions in South Taranaki as a perfect storm and calling on farmers to look out for each other. A medium adverse event was declared in the region before Christmas and emergency funds and tax relief have been approved for farmers struggling with the worst conditions seen in a lifetime. The Rural Support Trust coordinator for Taranaki, Marcia Paurini, says the drought came on the back of poor payouts in a very wet winter. It really creates a perfect storm. It's just, they just, you just can only hold so much pressure and so much stress and something has to go. Marcia Paurini says farmers who notice a neighbour or friend is not themselves should reach out and connect with them. The government has boosted the Rural Support Trust coffers by $210,000 to help cope with drought this summer and signalled farmers will be offered tax relief. The government has toughened its stance on Cody dieback, announcing moves that would force people going into affected areas to comply with any restrictions. At the moment, councils can ask visitors to take measures like disinfecting their boots or staying away from tracks, but can't make it compulsory. The Ministry for Primary Industries says it will work to put formal controls in place, but it's not saying where yet. It will also start a national pest management strategy, giving Cody dieback the sort of biosecurity status previously awarded to the kiwi fruit disease PSA or bovine tuberculosis. The ministry has been criticised by scientists and conservation groups for a lack of action on the disease. A former Marlborough farmer who lost a legal battle with the government over allegations his groundwater was poisoned by activities on the nearby Air Force base says he now feels vindicated. Gordon Appleton took the defence force to court in the 1990s but wasn't able to establish that poisons from Woodburn base had leaked into the aquifer and poisoned his deer. Late last year, the Defence Force announced it had discovered chemicals used in firefighting foam had leached into nearby soil and water at bases at Ohakia and Woodburn. Tests have now confirmed some properties have been contaminated. Mr Appleton says if it's proved he was right, the least he would expect is an apology from the government. What I have lost in the past has gone. I would like the government to say, yes, you were right. Gordon Appleton says the priority is for the contaminants to be cleaned up. The Children's Minister is aiming to stop the practice of children being remanded in police cells overnight. $27 million has been allocated to Oranga Tamariki to provide better support for young people in care or youth justice services. Charlie Drever reports. The Ministry for Vulnerable Children came under public scrutiny last year for remanding children in police cells overnight. The Minister Tracy Martin says $15.7 million of the funds will go towards improved care placements so those with high needs or emergency situations can be placed in a care home rather than police cells. The Children's Commissioner Andrew Beecroft has applauded the move, saying he's long advocated for it. The funding will also be used to improve the availability of care placements and trial ways to transition young people from care to independence. 
The opposition spokesperson for children, Paula Bennett, says, however, the extra funding is simply picking up where National left off, as they had allocated the money in last year's budget. Call Charlie Drever, TNA. It's five minutes past five. Sport and the prolonged struggles of a once-dominant Auckland side have motivated World Cup winning former All Blacks coach Sir Graham Henry to return to his roots. Auckland Rugby have announced Sir Graham as an assistant to new head coach Alana, Alama Iremia for this year's MPC. Sir Graham, who led Auckland to four straight MPC titles in the mid-1990s, says his reasons for returning are simple. I've come back to Auckland Rugby because I'm disappointed about what's happened in the last 10 years. You know, it hasn't been great. So rather than throw a hand grenade from outside, I've come in and trying to, try to help with inside and be a mentor to the coaches and the players and do a bit of coaching. Sir Graham Henry. Meanwhile, the New Zealand women's team have two wins on day one of the Sydney Sevens. After thumping Japan 48-7 in their first match, the Black Ferns have hammered rivals England 33-12. New Zealand's final pool game is against the USA shortly after 6 o'clock tonight. The New Zealand men's team opened their Sydney campaign later tonight against Russia, with that match kicking off at 9.50. Roger Federer is excited at his semi-final match-up with the South Korean star Hyung Chung in the Australian Tennis Open. Defending champion Federer says he was hugely impressed by world number 58 Chung's fourth round win over one of the Swiss star's longtime rivals Novak Djokovic. Tonight's match is expected to start about 9.30. And golf star Tiger Woods has made a respectable return to the PGA Tour. In his first official start since this time last year, Woods shot even past 72 to be seven shots off the lead after the first round of the Farmers Insurance Open. That's the news. Tonight on Nights... Country life goes to the source of the source with the celebration of the tomato and some of the people who grow them for a living. We have a mixtape from BFM radio host Pearl Little, and because it's January 26th, we are dedicating our first Sonic Tonic of the Year to Australia Day in all its musical glory, from Archie Roach to Kylie to Akadaka. Go West on Nights with me, Brian Crump, after the news at 7 on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow for the northern and central North Island from Northland to Taumata Nui and Taihape, including Bay of Plenty, long fine spells and a few showers, especially in the afternoons and evenings, when some may be heavy from Waikato southwards with thunderstorms, hail and localised downpours. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, mostly cloudy with a few showers, thunderstorms about the Gisborne Ranges today. Taranaki to Kapiti, mainly fine. Wellington to Wairarapa, uh, cloudy today with patchy drizzle, fine or becoming fine tomorrow. Marlborough, Nelson, Buller, Westland and Fiordland, mainly fine but low cloud about the Kaikoura coast. Isolated afternoon and evening showers inland, some heavy in the north with possible thunderstorms. Canterbury and Otago, cloudy periods about the coast and Canterbury Plains, fine inland with isolated afternoon and evening showers. Southland, fine today, showers developing tomorrow and the Chatham Islands, a few showers. It's eight and a half past five. Welcome everyone to Checkpoint for Friday the 26th of January tonight. The heat and its costs, firefighting foam and its costs, the doomsday clock and why it's been reset so close to an apocalypse. The Greens are in the market for a co-leader and the sheep to people ratio in New Zealand is closing. Thank you for joining us on Checkpoint. We begin tonight with uh, a health warning being issued by the chief coroner following the death by overheating of a Christchurch woman who had multiple sclerosis, which can make people more vulnerable to heat or high humidity. Uh, the woman who died from hypothermia on Wednesday was in Christchurch when it reached 32 degrees, was even hotter up to 37 degrees in the North Canterbury town of Wayo, a reprieve for some today, Christchurch down into the lower 20s, but it stayed hot in central Otago with another day pushing 30 degrees and next week is set to bring another stretch of hot weather 
across the South Island. Rachel Graham has more. A stark warning was issued today by the Chief Coroner, Judge Deborah Marshall, about the dangers from the hot weather. On Wednesday, a Christchurch woman with multiple sclerosis, who was in her early 60s, died from overheating. People with multiple sclerosis can struggle to control their body temperature in hot weather. Judge Marshall says people with multiple sclerosis or other illnesses which make them susceptible to overheating should keep an eye on any symptoms that may become worse in the hot weather. Dr Alastair Humphrey, the Medical Officer of Health for Canterbury, says most people with a chronic condition will find the condition gets worse if they are dehydrated. He says older people and children are also particularly at risk from the impacts of heat stress. Dr Humphrey says people should stay out of the sun. If you have to go out, wear sunscreen, keep to the shade if possible, and don't drink alcohol as it speeds up dehydration, and do drink water. Most importantly, make sure you're, you, you drink plenty of fluids because people are getting very dry and not necessarily realising it. They say you should have at least two litres a day, but of course for some people, um, if you're out um, exerting yourself, you'll need a lot more. Dr Humphrey says dehydration can also cause people to stop thinking clearly, so people should look out for others they think are at risk. The hot weather is also increasing the risk of fires and putting the rural fire services on alert. In North Canterbury, the Principal Fire Officer, Bruce Jaynes, says in preparation for next week's hot weather, the paid staff will be on high-level alert, with trucks and gear ready to go at a moment's notice. We'll also put uh, aircraft on standby, either fixed wing for patrols or helicopters for response, and we'll even go as far as having a crew of four or five people sitting beside the helicopter, especially in places like... And uh, Belmoral, you know, where your lead times to a given fire can be long if it's not beside a road. Bruce Jane says the rural crews are largely volunteers, so being on standby requires a major commitment for the teams. In Southland, fire services are already under strain, with teams still on site on the TY Peninsula after a large fire on Monday. Fire and Emergency Community and Engagement Coordinator for Southland, Sally Chesterfield, says the real concern is if they have to cope with multiple large fires, and so they've already started making contact with other regional teams to make sure they have backup when needed. We've made inquiries and we have set up some teams and positions in place from out of region that we can call on if we need to. So at this point the supplies can come from within the South Island. Some of the roles we're talking about are specialist roles, so managing aircraft, planning how to fight a fire, those kind of very specialist roles. There's not a lot of people around New Zealand that can do that, so sometimes we have to go further afield as well. In North Canterbury, Bruce Jaynes says so far the fire season has not been too bad, but he points out that all of Canterbury's major fires have happened in February in the midst of hot, dry weather. In Christchurch for Checkpoint, this is Rachel Graham. Meanwhile, prisoners are fainting and guards are struggling in heavy stab-proof vests as the heat wave hits jails around the country. The Howard League for Penal Reform says it has reports of prisoners passing out in horrific conditions in unventilated container cells at Rimutaka Prison. And the union that represents guards says that's not the only prison that's really suffering in the heat. Katie Scotcher reports... Rumutaka Prison's converted shipping container cells were opened in 2010 and have no air conditioning or cooling system. Prisoners have been offered frozen water, sunscreen and longer hours out of their cells to help deal with the heat. But the Howard League for Penal Reform Wellington President Madeline Rose says that's not good enough and air conditioning units should be brought in. I don't think it's enough for elderly or sick or heart patients and actually it's not enough full stop really, they need to immediately fix it. So they've got a duty of care to keep them well. The guards say they are suffering too. Their union, the Corrections Association, says other prisons across the country are in similar situations. President Alan Whitley says it's very hard on staff. They're finding it quite fatiguing, quite hot. They're wearing stab resistant body armour at the same time, which is trapping the, the body heat in there and it's pretty uncomfortable working conditions. Alan Whitley says they've had to take special steps to help the guards cope. What we're trying to do with, with the staff that are working there is find a way of getting them away from the prisoners where they can get their vests off and able to rehydrate and cool down. 
We've asked corrections to immediately look at anything that they can bring in that's going to reduce the body temperature. On the streets of Wellington, people had mixed feelings. They may be offenders and all the rest of it, but they're still human beings and it's just basic human decency. Well, it's not fair on anyone, really. The state's got a responsibility to make sure that everyone living or working in those conditions is healthy and comfortable. I think they should suffer as much as they can in prison. I don't think it should be happening because they're also human. Nobody should be living in really hot conditions. It's not nice, not comfy. In a statement, the Department of Corrections says it has no evidence prisoners have been passing out in the heat. But it says it is taking steps to prevent harm to prisoners and those working in the Rumutaka prison. It says it's increased the number of cell fans and is trying to encourage inmates to leave their cells more often. For Checkpoint, Katie Scotcher. Let's head from Rimutaka Prison across to South Taranaki, where fears are growing for the well-being of farmers as drought conditions look set to continue into traditionally the driest part of the summer. There should have been more rainfall by now than there has been by a margin. A medium adverse event was declared in the region before Christmas and emergency funds and tax relief have been approved for farmers struggling with the worst conditions some have seen in a lifetime. Our Taranaki Whanganui reporter Robin Martin has more. Don't be fooled by the traditional green tinge to South Taranaki pastures. The rain that freshened up the paddocks last week was too little and came too late for many farmers who have dried off their herds and sent underperforming and surplus stock to the works. The lucky ones are milking once a day and are scraping by with supplements and feed shipped in from outside the region. Upanaki farmer Kerry Smith milks about 150 cows on Wirimu Road. He says conditions are the worst he's ever seen. Yeah, no, we're, pretty, uh, we're very dry too. Um, yeah, we're quite short on feed. We've had to buy in a lot of feed. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty tough at the moment. Mr Smith says the cost of feed and lower production does weigh on his mind. Um, well, yeah, it's, uh, the pressure's certainly on. Um, you know, we do feel the pressure. So... But, you know, you've got to cope with these things. So there's not much you can do about it. You know, you've got animals to feed and, and keep going. So, yeah, you just got to cope. It's as simple as that. Jacques Lepreau milks about 400 cows in Pihama. Mr Lepreau says the drought came on the back of an incredibly wet winter and caught many by surprise. He says it meant many farmers had had to take drastic action. When there was no rain on the horizon... Um, yet we uh, got rid of uh, any cows that just weren't performing. You know, everyone in the district was doing the same. There were, there were stock trucks up everyone's driveways around the same time. Um, and we went once a day here uh, 10 days before Christmas. Mr Lepreau feared this could be the new normal. I don't know if it's sort of climate change or um, if it's just the new norm or, or what have you, but I've only been in the industry sort of 15 years. But um, talking to, um, you know, the older generations, they can only recall one year back in the 70s where they they recalled that it was similar to this at, at this time of the year. So, um, yeah, it's not normal. Marcia Paurini is the Rural Support Trust coordinator for Taranaki. Ms Paurini says the drought came on the back of poor payouts and a wet winter and the stress in the farming community was beginning to show. It really creates a perfect storm. So you've got tensions within the family starting to crack. You've got tensions between farm owners and share milkers. And it's just, they just, you just can only hold so much pressure and so much stress and something has to give. And it's either a relationship or tears over a table, you know what I mean? Ms Paurini says eight farmers have been in contact since a relief package was announced this month. The trust is calling for farmers to look out for each other. If your gut is telling you something's not quite right with this mate that you used to have beers with, you know, a year ago and, and something's not quite right, then you're probably right. So follow your instincts and go down and, and, and connect. Ms Paurini believes midwinter could be an even more difficult time emotionally for farmers because cash flows will be at rock bottom. Jacques Lepreau, meanwhile, is trying to see a silver lining to the crisis. The beach is free, so we've spent a bit of time at the beach, and because we're once a day, we we'll, you know being able to spend more time with the kids over the holidays. But um, yeah, we yeah, there's just no no extra spending um, on farm or on on the household. We're just we're just um, you know, living day by day basically. The government has boosted the Rural Support Trust coffers by two hundred and ten thousand dollars to help with drought relief 
and has signalled affected farmers will be offered tax concessions. I Taranaki mo te hōtaka o te ahihahi, ko Robin Martin Aho. And we will be back with the weather later. Uh, in Checkpoint, it's 20 minutes past five. A former Marlborough deer farmer who lost a fortune fighting the government over allegations his groundwater was poisoned by activities on the nearby Air Force base says he feels vindicated by recent revelations. Now, in the 1990s, Gordon Appleton wasn't able to establish that poisons from the Woodburn Air Base in Blenheim had leaked into the aquifer and poisoned his deer. Late last year, the Defence Force announced it had discovered chemicals used in firefighting foam had leached into nearby soil and water in bases in Ohakia and Woodburn, and tests have now confirmed some properties have been contaminated. Mr Appleton told our Nelson Marlborough reporter Tracy Neal the least he can hope for or could hope for, is an apology. Gordon Appleton's fight began like this. The first deer that I saw die was a pet hind that walked up our paddock and drank from a small spring. Within two or three minutes, she was laying down convulsing and died within minutes. In the 1990s, Mr Appleton lived on a Blenheim farm about one and a half kilometres downstream from the Woodburn base. He called the vet, the council and the health board and a meeting was held. Mr Appleton says post-mortems on some of the animals at the time pointed to contamination, but it wasn't clear where it might have been coming from. But he suspected Woodburn could have been the source. The arduous legal process that followed cost him financially and emotionally. He became what was described by some who lived nearby at the time as a social outcast. I took the Defence Department to the High Court. The trial took approximately eight weeks. We spent a fortune in getting water tests done. In the majority of those wells, we did find toxic products. Mr Appleton says he fight by selling assets, borrowing money and with help from family. So by the time I had finished this, this battle with the Air Force, I was 100% in debt. The Defence Force has now revealed seven among 64 properties tested at the Ohakia and Woodburn sites have been found to have been contaminated. Mr Appleton believes the recent revelations are the same as his own discoveries. He's relieved that the Defence Force is now taking it seriously, but he's worried about what the impact might be on those who have had long-term exposure to the chemicals. I am quite sad that it has taken so long for the story to be released and so many people potentially for the last 14, 15 or so years have continued to be poisoned. Mr Appleton, who now lives on a rural block south of Nelson, says if it's proved he was right all along, the least he would expect is an apology from the government. He says the priority now is for the contamination to be cleaned up. For Checkpoint, Tracy Neal. So what do the New Zealand Defence Force have to say? Well, as we learnt last night, and as we told you, they don't seem to do interviews. In a statement a short time ago, they told us Mr Appleton's case was canvassed extensively in court, and they don't have anything more to add. 23 and a half past five on Checkpoint. The Green Party is kicking off the contest to see who will replace Materia Ture as co lady You'll remember, of course, that Ms Ture resigned in August of last year following admission she'd committed benefit fraud decades earlier. Since then, the party has carried on with just James Shaw at the helm. Today at Parliament, Mr Shaw unveiled the timeline to appoint his new co-leader. Nominations open in a week's time, then in roughly two months, the party's delegates will vote, all 150 of them. The last time we did this, uh, which is when I got elected, we, had, uh, we did have a very long campaign. It was actually five months long, and in hindsight that was too long. Uh, we actually, now that we're in government, have got to kind of stay focused on the business at hand. Um, and so we want to get this uh, out of the way and make sure that our team is completely focused on, on the business of being in government. So basically, by the time Easter is done, we'll have a new co-leader in place uh, alongside me here. Who will that be? Well, any woman who is a member of the party, including those outside Parliament, can throw her hat into the ring. There are three uh, chief contenders. Julianne Genta, the Minister for Women, a fierce advocate for public transport and cannabis reform. There's Marama Davidson, number two on the party's list, and not a minister which could play for or against her. She has a long history of social justice campaigning and is perhaps... 
the clearest parallel to Ms Tude, and then there's Eugenie Sage, the Conservation Minister and a staunch environmentalist, a true Green, and like Ms Tude, she's from the South Island. None of them are allowed to comment publicly yet, and James Shaw isn't showing his hand either. I will not be backing any one candidate, no, and in fact all of our MPs, uh, whether they're candidates at well, candidates are obviously going to back themselves, but MPs have said that no, we will not be making any comment publicly uh, whether we're supporting someone. He does, James Shaw, however, have a message for potential contenders learning from his experience of having run for the top job himself in 2015. Maintain your integrity, run a clean campaign, put out the you know, reasons why you think that you are the most credible candidate for uh, not just members but for the wider public and also um, make sure you know what the job entails when you actually win. It, it is an extraordinary privilege uh, to get to stand for the leadership of the Green Party, whether you win or not. It is an amazing kind of experience uh, and so I would say to anybody who is considering standing, uh, make sure that you enjoy the, enjoy the journey. That's the Greens co-leader James Shaw. The new co-leader will be announced on April the 8th. The doomsday clock is now at two minutes before midnight. The board of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists has moved it for 30 seconds to put it the closest, the closest it's been to the apocalypse since 1953. Why and how can people respond when the news is so dire and the issues involved so large? To answer those questions, we have as guests tonight two of the people who made the decision to put the clock forward. The first person we spoke to is Professor of Astrophysics and Physics, Robert Rosner, Chair of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist Science and Security Board. The decision to move the, uh, the minute hand uh, by 30 seconds had to do with a, a confluence of things that we viewed as uh, distinctly negative. Uh, so it, it has to do with, uh, on the part of the United States, the, the, kind of, the nature of the rhetoric that's uh, coming uh, out of the White House, uh, the, the sense that, um, uh, that our allies uh, can't always uh, know exactly which way uh, the United States is going, uh, the conflicts that have arisen, uh, that have become really particularly virulent uh, between the United States and um, uh, North Korea, uh, the uh, increasing uh, challenges uh, that we that the United States faces vis-à-vis -vis, uh, uh, the Soviet, uh, the, the former Soviet Union, the Russia, and in fact the general deterioration uh, of relations between Russia and the NATO countries. Uh, so, so it's the confluence of all these sort of things on the nuclear end that led us uh, to change the clock by 30 seconds. But it's also a condition by the fact that on the climate side we see a distinct uh, lack of progress. We were, last year, we were actually quite heartened uh, by the fact that um, uh, most of the countries of the world, virtually all, uh, came to an agreement in Paris. And, uh, and th that there were offers on the table what to do about the uh, carbon loading of the atmosphere. Um, that has changed. Uh, uh, President Trump has said that uh, basically he he has not formally abrogated the Paris Agreement, but he, uh, but his his words, his tweets suggest that uh, that's the direction in which he's heading. Uh, he certainly has appointed what uh, some people would call climate deniers, uh, climate change deniers, to, to for example the Environmental Protection Agency here in the United States. Um, it's sort of the integration of all these things that led us to 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 move the minute hand. In the direction that we did. So the board's chairman, Professor Robert Rosner, tells us it's a confluence of things. North Korea, Donald Trump and his bellicose rhetoric, the self-serving and disruptive machinations of Russia, climate change, all of that stuff adding up. Now, we turn to his colleague on the board who also kindly spoke to us this afternoon. Her name is Dr. Suzette McKinney. She's executive director of the Illinois Medical District. She's based in Chicago and her speciality is public health preparedness. So I asked her, how do we get political preparedness when the electoral cycle is driven by well, much more local and short-term interests? How do ordinary people put the doomsday clock's concerns on the political agenda? Well, you know, what I would say is one of the things that's very important is that we not allow ourselves 
to get distracted by less important issues to the point that we don't pay attention to the issues that are discussed in the clock statement. And I think the message to politicians and our elected officials is clear. If you are caught in this cycle about reelection, please remember who the people are that put you in the office to begin with. And if these issues, you know, if the message can be driven home that these issues are relevant to the people who elected you and that we care about them and we are expecting them to care about these same issues, then I think that's how we persuade politicians to begin to pay attention. Right now, particularly here in the United States, we are distracted by many other things going on. And so no one is talking about climate change. No one is talking about the nuclear situation. No one is talking about emerging technologies and other issues that make this world a dangerous place because we're distracted by other things. And so, again, that's why I go back to the importance of the general public educating themselves and understanding what these issues are and making sure that your elected officials know that you are concerned about them and expect that they do the same. Mm. In the United States, it's your elected officials you, you're distracted by, isn't it? One in particular, Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and at some level, that's self-serving. I mean, the more he tweets about nonsense, the less actually he is required to focus on these things. Sure, sure. Yes, I've, I've heard many say the same. But, you know, again, I... I You know, I think that if we care at all about the type of world, not only that we're living in today, but the type of world that we will leave behind for our children and our grandchildren, we have to be more conscious. Dr. Suzette McKinney. So let's return to the board's chair to end with Professor Robert Rosner, who actually does move the clock forward. He says all will be lost if people give up hope. And he believes people are, in fact, less cynical than some politicians. In fact, he thinks he knows the people who are most likely to encourage meaningful political change, and they're not who we might think. Certainly, uh, if one looks, if you like, the, the, the folks that, uh, that, certainly now speaking for myself, hmm. that I would like to reach most, uh, most urgently, are actually what I would call the thinking Republicans, and there are lots of them. They are folks that are socially a bit conservative, that are uh, f- uh, fiscally, economically conservative, uh, but um, they're thinking sensible people, and uh, they don't uh, they don't react uh, in a way with a knee jerk fashion, uh, and um, those are the ones that we're trying to reach, and there are a lot of them. If uh, if uh, you know, if all is lost, why would you bother, right? Uh, if it were all lost, we wouldn't have bothered with the clock statement. We wouldn't have bothered with anything. In a, in a sense, the the way I look at it is the the bulletin and the clock serve as a reminder that we not only care, but that we think that it's not hopeless, that we think that we can reach people and that we can affect people's opinions. That's Professor Robert Rosner, Chair of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists Science and Security Board. You are with Checkpoint on RNZ. Coming up, seek peace or aid Donald Trump's ultimatum to Palestine. The Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern gifts a prized bottle of single malt whiskey to Dunedin. We'll explain in a cafe chat we call Tomara Nui's Big Mama Cafe. As temperatures there reach 33 degrees today, we'd love your feedback. Text us 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. We're on Facebook, of course, where you can also watch us. And you can email Checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. Nona next with... Uh, business, but with the time at 26 minutes to six, here's the headlines. Canterbury's Medical Officer of Health, Alistair Humphrey, says older people, those with chronic conditions and children, are particularly at risk from heat stroke. It says, uh, or heat stress, it's, it comes as the Chief Coroner warns people with multiple sclerosis to be extra careful in hot weather after a woman died from overheating in Christchurch. Prisoners are fainting and guards are struggling in heavy stab-proof vests as the heatwave affects jails around the country.
The Howard League for Penal Reform says Rimutaka prison inmates are passing out in horrific conditions in unventilated container cells. The union that represents guards says other prisons are also suffering in the heat. The Rural Support Trust says drought conditions in South Taranaki are a perfect storm and it's asking farmers to look out for each other. Emergency funds and tax relief have been approved for farmers struggling with the worst conditions seen in a lifetime. The Ministry for Primary Industries is to start a national pest management strategy to battle Cody dieback, as it has so it has the same biosecurity status given to the kiwi fruit disease PSA and bovine tuberculosis. Currently, councils can only ask visitors to parks to disinfect their boots or stay away from tracks, but it can't make it compulsory. A former Marlborough farmer who lost a legal battle over contamination of his water now feels vindicated by positive tests for contaminants on properties near Air Force bases. Gordon Appleton took the Defence Force to court in the 1990s but couldn't prove poisons from Woodburn Base had leaked into the aquifer and poisoned his deer. The Children's Minister wants to stop children being remanded in police cells overnight and improve the care and protection of young people. $27 million has been allocated to Oranga Tamariki to provide better support for young people in care and in youth justice services. Those are the headlines. I'm back at six. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina Batten. Let's turn to business news now with Nona Peltier on the other side of me in the studio here. You were talking about this last night. This is the reaction to, to quit paying out dividends to many of Trust Power's yeah. customers, right? And there has been more reaction? Yes, one of the analysts who looks at the energy sector is quite uh, astute at this. His name is uh, Andrew Harvey Green. He's with Forsyth Bar. He crunched the numbers, produced a report, and said, well, this is going to cost quite a lot uh, for Trust Power. And it's the, the idea that the company's share value has dropped is really what you'd expect given the uh, idea of cutting these dividends because when you do that, you also sever the loyalty that the customers feel to that company because they're shareholders as well. After a while, they don't get the dividends, so hmm, that opens the door to more competition because loyalty falls and that's going to have an impact. He thinks somewhere between um, 15 and $23 million a year. Now, I spoke with him. We have a little wow. bit of audio from him, yeah. One of the really interesting things through this process is the rationale that's been given by the trust for the changes, and that's looking at the uncertainties going forward in the electricity sector, just around um, sort of regulatory issues, technology issues, and those sorts of things. And using that as a justification, which I must admit does seem a little bit odd in my in my personal view, um, it does appear to me that if you had that view, then the logical thing to be doing right now would probably be selling your trust power shares as opposed to doing what they're doing. But um, yeah, that, that, I guess that's a question for them. In terms of the value of the company, we saw the share price fall. Do you think that's fair? Uh, yes, it is. But the key impact to Trust Power is that one of the things that they are able to do with this structure is, is the, um, the, the electricity charges to the towering of consumers tend to be a little bit higher because they know that... Uh, that consumers are getting that dividend checked at the other end, and so m there'll be some margin pressure going on to uh, trust power as a result of these changes. That is energy analyst at Forsyth Bar, Andrew Harvey Green, talking to Nona Peltier a short time ago. Nona is beside me in the studio here. And Nona, Bitcoin in the news again. That's right, Bitcoin is in the news again. again. Yes, indeed. Focus on 50 the money. Cents. Money. Look, he's playing underneath you now. You've got an have you? Hold on a sec, we're just gonna, we're just gonna relish. Money. Starting to feel like there's nothing left to talk about but the money. Money. No, no, tell us, why are we listening to 50 Cent? Well, he's got some serious coins. <laughs> We're talking Bitcoin. Yes, he has some 700 coins. So suddenly he's discovered he's a millionaire. How bizarre. Yes, well, considering the fellow was bankrupt, he declared bankruptcy in 2015, came out of bankruptcy just a year ago, really, and then suddenly discovered that he had these 700 coins because he was one of the first uh, musicians to uh, accept payment in Bitcoin. And that was for one of his albums, Animal Ambition. Now, you know, that, that album sold, what, 124,000 copies as of December 2014. It wasn't exactly a uh, major uh, critical success, but when you can look at uh, Ching Ching, you know, $8 million. Okay, at the time, Bitcoin was worth oh, just about 660 bucks. Now, guess what it's worth? Yeah, no, tell me. Eleven and a half thousand U.S. dollars. And how many dollars. did he get? How many did he, he get? He has seven hundred of them. So look, I did the maths for us. That's about eight million or so. Yeah. 
Very nice if you can get it, huh? Go, Mr. Scent. That's right. Uh, what happened on the markets today, Arnona? Well, okay, so our market actually fell about 0.7%, uh, 58 points to 8,311. That was helped down by Trust Power's share price, which ended down nearly 3%. That's in addition to yesterday, nearly 3%. Air New Zealand was also hit hard, close to 3%, with oil trading at a three-year high, $70.25 US a barrel. That's right. for Brent crude. Yeah. And what's interesting about that is Donald Trump for some inexplicable reason is talking up his dollar you know so the US dollar makes America great again and as a result the dollar went up ours went down 73.4 US cents 91.1 cents Australian and 51.7 cents point seven pence there you go no, no Pelsio, thank you so much great week have a great weekend and you uh, let's go to the weather now as we do each night at this time it's service meteorologist John Law Kia ora, John as we head in towards Saturday up towards Auckland, we could find an isolated shower just springing up as we head through towards the afternoon. But for many of us, it is a dry looking story and still pretty warm as well. Those temperatures are around about 20 degrees Celsius to start things off and climb in quite nicely through the day. For the North Island, the warmest spots are likely to be somewhere like the Waikato, with temperatures up to about 30 degrees Celsius. A little bit more cloud into those central parts and a few showers to watch out for for Taupo and Rotorua. A dry day down across the southern parts of the North Island, a bit more cloud around first thing for Wellington and the Wairapa, but plenty of sunshine up from the Kapiti coast right the way up towards Whanganui. Plenty of dry and sunny conditions through there, while more cloud on that eastern coast and a few showers to watch out for first thing in Gisborne. Down on the South Island, after a cloudier start in Christchurch, it should brighten up nicely through the daytime and staying dry throughout as well. Highs there, 25 degrees Celsius, but there's plenty of dry and sunny weather on the South Island. Just a little bit more cloud arriving later on for the far south and perhaps an isolated shower. And that's it from me. Thanks, John. Have a great weekend. I see from John that the high in Queenstown tomorrow, 30. Uh, lots of highs, 30 plus uh, in Central and more to come uh, in the week ahead. We'll have more on the weather coming up, but let's go to Dunedin. The Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern was in Dunedin today to reopen the historic law courts. The incredible Gothic style building was designed by Chief Government Architect, also known as John Campbell, and built at the turn of the century for £20,000. It's about $3.7 million in today's term. Inflation adjusted, uh, but the cost of building inflation has been altogether uh, speedier. The building was at risk of being mothballed after it was deemed an earthquake risk in 2011, but after a strident local campaign and a $20 million revamp, far greater than the original cost of the building, even inflation adjusted, it's spack and more impressive than ever. Our Otago Southern reporter, Timothy Brown, who's been doing wonderful work for us this week, was at the opening. A quintessential Dunedin welcome for the quintessential modern Prime Minister. Jacinda Ardern's opening of the Dunedin Law Courts was the perfect marriage between the old and the new. In her speech, she paid homage to the history of the Southern Landmark, which originally opened in 1902. While the building has been carefully strengthened and refurbished, it now beats with a new, strong heart. And everyone involved should be immensely proud of that. You have preserved a Taonga. You have also updated it, and I give you my thanks for your craftsmanship and your work. A time capsule is being buried to mark the reopening of the courthouse, and Jacinda Ardern has included a number of items inside it. At the request of sick 12-year-old Whakatane boy Malachi Agnew, the Prime Minister placed a New Zealand flag in the capsule. She also found an opportunity for humour in her offerings, placing a gift from partner Clark Gayford, which is no longer of use to her. Personally, I've also added a bolt of, uh, bottle of South Island single malt. <laughs> difficult to part with. <laughs> I don't have much use for it at the moment though. <laughs> it was given to me by my partner Clark for my birthday in 2017. No, he doesn't know I'm pushing it in there. <laughs> Ms Ardern paid tribute to those in the legal fraternity and community who fought to return services to the building. The court was relocated across town after the 2011 Christchurch earthquake. Treasury deemed the building unfit for purpose and felt the investment in the new courthouse warranted a permanent move there. But the community despised the plan, and after a vocal campaign, particularly by prominent Dunedin lawyer Anne Stevens, Cabinet recognised the importance of the building. 
Mrs Stevens says the reopening of the historic courthouse feels like a homecoming. It's absolutely beautiful. It's the most historic courthouse in New Zealand and it, its um, function performs extremely well. It works. But it's part of the integral historical aspect of our city and of New Zealand's history. So it's, it's vital to preserving our, our, our tradition and justice. Anne Stevens says the fight to save the court was, quote, fun and was always going to succeed because it had to. Dunedin's legal fraternity turned out in huge numbers this afternoon to mark the reopening. The tradition dates back to 1902. A special hearing of the High Court marked the first use of the restored courthouse. The Chief Justice, Dame Sean Elias, says the efforts of the legal profession and the community to save the courthouse are commendable. The Prime Minister said recently, or made allusion recently, um, to the view that it takes a village to raise a child. Well, I think it takes a great city to raise and keep a courthouse like this. Sean Elias also singled out the efforts of Mrs Stevens. Court services will return to the building on February 5. In Dunedin, for Checkpoint, Timothy Brown. Well, with the Prime Minister in Dunedin, we thought we'd use the opportunity to ask her about another building of significance for the city and indeed the Otago region, that new hospital. Here's our reporter, Timothy Brown, again. Being in Dunedin today, an issue of great importance here is the Dunedin Hospital rebuild. Yes. Are you in a position to comment about the progress being made there? Oh, well, I've already seen papers relating to it, but maybe I should leave that to the Minister of Health and uh, local MP, David, David Clark. Oh, look, um, I'm delighted, firstly, that we've been able to take some early steps, like uh, being really clear that there's going to be no public-private partnership, as the Prime Minister announced during the election campaign. That has allowed planning to be sped up. Um, we've pledged to uh, focus on a central city rebuild and uh, announcements have been made around that already, uh, the limited scope of the, uh, the area we're looking at and uh, we want to get construction underway in the first term. So it's delightful finally to be able to be, able to be in a position to drive it because we've watched delays for so many years and the people of Dunedin have put up with those delays. People send me photos just about every week of some part of the hospital that is cordoned off. Mm. Uh, we know there's asbestos, we know it leaks and so on and now we're in a position to drive change. Uh, I'm not going to pretend it's going to be easy. Uh, it never has been an easy challenge but we're determined that we start construction and that it's in the central city and uh, now we're in a position to do it. So has there been a site of preference identified? Uh, there are sites being worked on right now. Um, Pete Hodson locally is leading that team. He would be the person to talk to about the stage of progress, but he's uh, indicated to me that he hopes to have a site of preference notified publicly by the end of March. Even uh, I think the fact that that appointment has been made shows our determination to get on with things as well. And comfortable that ground will be broken by the end of 2020? Yep, I am. I'm comfortable that we're on track to do that. It's a commitment we made. It's the Prime Minister and Health Minister talking to our reporter, Timothy Brown. The American President Donald Trump has spent his first day at the World Economic Forum in Switzerland where he's expected to push his America First trade message when he delivers a keynote speech tomorrow. Today he met with some of his key allies, including the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, and he issued a threat to the Palestinians, telling them until they show some respect and take part in peace talks, there will be no more aid money from the US. The BBC's John Sopel is travelling with Mr Trump and filed this report. In a blur of rotor blades, a swirl of snow and a near avalanche of expectation, Donald Trump blew into Davos today. Very exciting to be here. We're very happy to be here. The United States is doing very well. But he came with a message. He'd come to spread peace and prosperity. This is not exactly Daniel into the lion's den. Donald Trump and the Davos set are not exactly natural soulmates. But nevertheless, the World Economic Forum has come to a virtual standstill. Mr President, are you looking forward to your meeting with Theresa May? After their spat over those anti-Muslim Britain First videos and his cancelled trip to London, they were falling over themselves to be nice. Problems in the relationship? A false rumour, said the President. Thank you very much. It's an honour to be with Prime Minister May. We've had a great discussion. We're on the same wavelength in, I think, every respect. The Prime Minister and myself have had a, a really great relationship, although some people don't necessarily believe that, but I can tell you it's true. I have a tremendous respect for the Prime Minister and the job she's doing. And the Prime Minister beamed. 
as you say, we've had a great discussion today, and we continue to have that really special relationship between the UK and the United States. It's yeah. landing shoulder to shoulder because we're facing the same challenges across the world. Yeah. And as you say, we're working together to defeat those uh, challenges and to meet them. And Downing Street has confirmed that officials are now finalising arrangements for a working visit to the UK by Donald Trump that will take place later this year. Though no mention of the invitation for a state visit that Theresa May extended a year ago. The CEO of Stato, uh, this evening the president had dinner with European business leaders, some more important to Mr Trump personally than others the makers of aspirin. I think you take it as well. I do, I take one. <laughs> I, I generally, I should say, I only take beer. <laughs> one aspirin a day. That's, so Once far it's been working. His whole purpose of this trip to Davos, to sell America. When I decided to come to Davos, I didn't think in terms of elitist or globalist. I, think, I thought in terms of lots of people that want to invest lots of money and they're all coming back to the United States, they're coming back to America. And I thought of it much more in those terms. Tomorrow comes the president's keynote address, the protectionist among the free traders, the America first president amid the globalists. It might not be a meeting of minds. But say it quietly, Donald Trump seems to be enjoying himself. That's John Sopel reporting from the World Economic Forum in Davos. The deadline's looming and possibly also the scrap heap for Northland's only tertiary arts course. The Northland region's Polytech has warned it will end the programme unless there's an increase in student numbers and with days to go it's still 10 students short. Lois Williams reports. North Tech announced late last year it would be cutting courses and closing campuses to cope with a projected $4 million loss. After students and some civic leaders protested, it agreed to a reprieve for the degree courses in sport and recreation and visual arts. If there were enough new enrolments in 2018, the Polytech bosses said the courses could continue. But artist and tutor Faith McManus says the arts course is still 10 students short of a future. We were told that we could continue to run if we got enough students for our first year. And we were given the number just before we went on holiday. Um, and that number is 25 people for the first year. Or um, the f it'll be in teach-out mode. It'll be the end of teaching arts in, in North Northland. Faith McManus says the arts course has until February the 5th to attract those 10 new students and she's not sure it's going to happen. The programme has had its critics at times but has also produced many fine artists. Among the graduates is Linda Mum, one of the three women who designed the Tinoranga Tiratanga flag. She's now a tutor herself in Tauranga and she says if it hadn't been for the North Tech arts course she'd probably be on a benefit. Linda Munn says for many talented but disadvantaged Northland teens, the Whangare campus is their only hope of a tertiary education. Our young people won't go on to further education if they have to travel to Auckland. There's enough poverty, it's too hard for them to live in Auckland. So I think it's real silliness that even if you're in Kaitaia, that you can't go and make art or learn the fundamentals and if you want to become an artist or, or in that field of work, you have to travel to Auckland, Wellington, Palmerston North. Now young people won't cope, so they'll just stay home. North Tech appears to have done little to promote the arts course over the break, but tutors, students and the Northland arts community have been pushing it on social media. And they're getting support from community leaders who see the arts as a strong selling point for Whangare. David Wilson manages the region's economic development agency, Northland Inc. He says a city that's about to build the unique Hundertwasser Arts Centre should not be closing the door on local talent. From a tourism point of view, I mean, visitors really want to know about our place and our people. And if we don't have artists, who will actually produce that? And I understand, you know, where the tertiary institutions are at in terms of having to meet budgets and having to make sure that courses pay for themselves. And the, but I also feel that we lose the arts at our peril. North Tech failed to respond to our request for comment and for a progress report on the other course at risk, sport and recreation. 
But the Minister for Education, Chris Hipkins, did reply. He says the provision of high-quality tertiary education in the regions is important for regional development and ensuring a skilled local workforce. He says the government's inherited a system that's badly underfunded and under serious strain. Mr Hipkins says he's asked the Tertiary Education Commission to look into how that system operates because he wants better and more sustainable outcomes for local students and businesses. For Checkpoint, Lois Williams. It's exactly five minutes to six on Friday night on Checkpoint. Now, it's a well-known fact that New Zealanders live in a country where the human population is outnumbered by sheep, but perhaps what's less known is that we're not as outnumbered by sheep as we used to be. Back in 1982, for every one person, there was 22 sheep, one to 22. Figures show there's been a considerable drop since then, equating to about six sheep for every person. And that's making events like the historic Harwood and U auction held in North Canterbury today less common. With this report, here is Maya Burry. Ten one, the big, the bold, they've got plenty of bone. You get them behind them, they've got great depth. Big across the middle, everything right about them. Yeah, the judges say they're on top of the flight, they turned it. Who's got turn go? Turn go. In the North Canterbury town of Harwarden, farmers and stock agents have been coming together every January since 1930 to buy and sell ewes. Today, 18,000 sheep filled the pens of the stockyard and more than 300 buyers and sellers gathered around as the bids were placed. Stock agent John McCone has been coming to the U Fair for more than 30 years. He says there used to be plenty of annual auctions in the region, but few remained. We used to have probably half a dozen of these sales. Now this is the only sale of this type in, held in North Canterbury. A generation ago, the um, the, the national ewe flock was probably um, approaching 70 million. Now it's about uh, early 20 million. So that's it. That's it in a nutshell. The ewe numbers are back, and that's been replaced with dairying and dairy support, and yeah, just different land uses. Following three years of drought in North Canterbury, some of the farmers who attended the auction today were looking to build back up their ewe numbers after they had to destock by up to 30 to 40 per cent during the big dry. Another stock agent, Fred Fowler, says good prices at the freezing works and the shortage of sheep was helping to drive up prices for ewes at the auction, which could make it hard for some of those wanting to buy. That has been a big thing, and certainly the shortage with the drought, yes, and now they're trying to restock and the prices are pretty uh, pretty strong, so, yeah, so it's got uh, pretty pretty difficult for them, you know, and not not only having to pay for the drought, but, uh, you know, having to pay for, to restock. Scargill sheep farmer Stu Lowe says it's a relief to be out of the drought, but he's taking a conservative approach and not rushing to refill the paddocks. We're still well down on our numbers, but we're, we're getting back slowly, so hopefully the weather plays its part and we can get back to, back to the usual stocking levels. And is it nice to be in this position now where you can look to buy instead of looking to, to sell? Exactly, yeah, no, your headspace is a lot better when, when you're in this situation of yeah, buying rather than having to sell. It's not a, not a pleasant place to be in. The chair of the North Canterbury Rural Support Trust, Doug Archbold, says this is the first time the fair, which is an important event for the rural community, has been held since North Canterbury escaped drought. He says morale is much higher. It's just the, you know, you can probably even pick it out, it's just the general tone here. People are a lot happier, they've got a smile on their face. Um, and it, it has been, for our job in the rural support, it's been, um, we have been really busy um, trying to hold communities together through the drought. So um, this is just great. Doug Archbold says while things are looking up for rural North Canterbury, it's still early days and it will likely take farmers three to four years to fully recover. For Checkpoint, Maya Burry. Thank you very much indeed, Maya. Maria is, uh, is, is, is one of our brilliant young reporters uh, who um, shoots stories on their phone. Logan Church is another one. Laura Tupo the other day. We're getting lots of feedback on those stories because people love to see the pictures. They're pu absolutely beautiful pictures of, uh, of sheep. Um, I suspect, actually, those of you who live where sheep live would not know the extent to which townies love a good sheep, not just eating them either. We had a, They're very popular. Yeah, they are. Yeah. I suspect my children have seen sheep in their lives, in the flesh, for real, about twice.
Really? Uh, yeah, other than from the cars we drove along. There aren't yeah. any in Auckland. I think I think all children should have the experience yeah. of milking a cow as well. Yeah, pretty magic. Yeah, great. Uh, speaking of the country, after the news, we are called Tomata Nui. Um, we do a thing which is we phone cafes to just take the pulse on an issue and we just ask them to pass the phone around. And the smaller the town we do it in, the more laid back and delightful the response. You just find people up and say, can you pass the phone around? Oh, yes. Well, in Tomata Nui, it's magic. That's coming up at six o'clock. RNZ News at six. Ngā mihi nui. Good evening. Ko Katrina Batten tēnei. The death by overheating of a Christchurch woman with multiple sclerosis has led to the chief coroner issuing a warning to people with illnesses that make it hard to control body temperature. Christchurch hit 32 degrees on Wednesday and the North Canterbury town of Wyo 37. Canterbury's Medical Officer of Health, Alistair Humphrey, says most people with a chronic condition will find the condition gets worse if they're dehydrated. He says older people and children are also particularly at risk from the impact of heat stress. Most importantly, make sure you're, you, you drink plenty of fluids because people are getting very dry and not necessarily realising it. They say you should have at least two litres a day, but of course for some people, um, if you're out um, exerting yourself, you'll need a lot more. Dr Humphrey says dehydration can also cause people to stop thinking clearly, so people should look out for others as they, that they think are at risk. The Rural Support Trust is describing drought conditions in South Taranaki as a perfect storm and calling on farmers to look out for each other. A medium adverse event was declared there before Christmas and emergency funds and tax relief have been approved for farmers struggling with the worst conditions seen in a lifetime. The Rural Support Trust coordinator for Taranaki, Marcia Paurini, says the drought came on the back of poor payouts and a wet winter. Ms Paurini says farmers who notice neighbours or friends who are not themselves should reach out and connect with them. The board, the government has boosted the trust's coffers by $210,000 to help cope with drought this summer and signalled farmers will be offered tax relief. As the long hot summer continues, Southland fire teams are contacting other regions in case they have to be called in to help fight another big blaze. The region has had a string of days over 30 degrees in recent weeks and more are forecast for next week. Southland's fire and emergency has also dealt with a large fire on Tiwai Point this week, which is still being monitored by a fire crew. Its spokesperson Sally Chesterfield says the service is under strain. We've made inquiries and we have set up some teams and positions in place from out of region that we can call on if we need to. So at this point the supplies can come from within the South Island. Sally Chesterfield says they can currently cope with one large fire but the dry conditions mean they have to prepare for how to deal with many fires. A New York Times report says the US President Donald Trump called for the special counsel Robert Mueller to be fired in June last year. The newspaper said says the president never went through with the order because the White House counsel, Don McGahn, threatened to quit instead of carrying it out. The New York Times White House correspondent Maggie Haberman told CNN the Huffington Post's Chris Reddy was strongly criticised by the White House last year when he suggested Mr Trump had called for Robert Mueller to be fired. I am a little surprised at how effective people in the White House were at lying to us about what was actually going on at the time. It was untrue to say that he was not thinking of firing Mueller. They all insisted that Ruddy was wrong. People internally sought to discredit Ruddy. Ruddy was clearly right, and there was even more there. It does make you wonder what else has happened. Maggie Haberman from the New York Times. The government has toughened its stance on Cody dieback, announcing moves that would force people going into affected areas to comply with any restrictions. At the moment, councils can ask visitors to take measures such as disinfecting their boots or staying away from tracks, but can't make them compulsory. The Ministry for Primary Industries says it will work to put formal controls in place, but it's not saying where yet. It will also start a national pest management strategy, giving Cody dieback the sort of biosecurity status previously accorded to the kiwi fruit disease PSA or bovine tuberculosis. A developer has been charged for two and uh, jailed for two and a half months after killing four trees and severely damaging three more. Augustine Lau called in a contractor to fell six large pohutakawa and a tōtara on his property near Waiwera, north of Auckland. Some of the trees were more than 100 years old. Edward Gay reports. 
Auckland Council brought the legal action against Lau in the Auckland District Court. Judge Paul Keller described the damage as brutal and said it was hard to imagine a more deliberate case. He said Lau was motivated by financial gain. He had the trees pulled down to get better views and increase his property value. The council's manager for regulatory compliance, Steve Pearce, said Lau received warnings to stop the work but went ahead with it anyway. Lau told the court the trees were brought down after they were damaged in a storm, but the damage was found to be minor. I tāmaki makaurau ko Edward Gayaho. The Oscar-winning actor Casey Affleck has pulled out of this year's Academy Awards over accusations of historical sexual harassment. By tradition, Affleck, who won Best Actor for Manchester by the Sea in 2017, would have been expected to present the Best Actress Award this year. The actor was sued by two women crew members for alleged sexual harassment in 2010. He settled out of court. It's five and a half past six. Sport, the New Zealand men's sevens team are taking a simple approach to the new format for the Sydney leg of the World Series. Teams usually play three matches each day, but this year they'll play one match on Friday night, two on Saturday and three on Sunday. New Zealand start their campaign against Russia at 9.50 tonight and Curry says the team were planning a laid-back day. You've got to just relax on that first day, it's a long day. Uh, don't play till about 7 o'clock at night, so um, plenty of time just to relax and ease into it. Scott Curry. Meanwhile, the New Zealand women's team have started their Sydney campaign with wins over Japan and England. Their final pool game against the USA starts in about five minutes. England are, hope, are attempting to recover from making a horror start to the fourth one-day cricket international against Australia in Adelaide. The visitors were five wickets down for just eight runs after losing the toss and being sent in to bat. A short time ago, they were 61 for five after 21 overs. Roger Federer is excited for tonight's Australian Open semi-final matchup with South Korean star Hyung Chung. Defending champion Federer says he was hugely impressed by Chung's fourth round win over one of the Swiss star's longtime rivals, Novak Djokovic. I thought he played an incredible match against Novak. I mean, to beat him here is one of the tough things to do in our sport, I believe. I know that Novak maybe was not at 110%, but he was all right, you know, and he was giving it a fight till the very end. So. To close it out, that was uh, mighty impressive. Roger Federer. Tonight's match is expected to start about 9.30. That's the news. On the programme tomorrow morning, Michael Wolfe, the author of Fire and Fury, the book about President Trump that reads as if the White House is an asylum and the inmates have taken over. Do not spin the parasitic worm. It could provide the answer to a range of autoimmune and inflammatory diseases Dr. Cara Philby on the hidden charms of hookworms, for example, and Oscar Keitley on why his play about dawn raids is relevant 20 years since its premiere. Join me, Kim Hill, tomorrow morning from 8 on RNZ National. Net service weather through to midnight tomorrow for northern and central North Island from Northland to Taumaranui and Thaihape, including Bay of Plenty. Long fine spells and a few showers, especially in the afternoons and evenings, when some, some may be heavy from Waikato southwards with thunderstorms, hail and localised downpours. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, mostly cloudy with a few showers, thunderstorms about the Gisborne Ranges today. Taranaki to Kapiti, mainly fine. Wellington and Wairarapa, cloudy today with patchy drizzle, fine or becoming fine tomorrow. Marlborough, Nelson, Buller, Westland and Fiordland, mainly fine but low cloud about the Kaikoura coast. Isolated afternoon and evening showers inland, some heavy in the north with possible thunderstorms. Canterbury and Otago, cloudy periods about the coast and Canterbury plains, fine inland with isolated afternoon and evening showers. Southland, fine today, showers developing tomorrow, and the Chatham Islands, a few showers. It's eight and a half past six, and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thanks, Katrina Gossett. Kim Hill interview with Michael Wolf tomorrow will be a crack. Oh, so exciting. Yeah. Really looking forward to that. Um, have a wonderful weekend. You too. Cheers, Katrina. Keep, keep cool. Yes. <laughs> we turn now to youth unemployment. Before Christmas, Shane Jones was suggesting his nephews in Northland need to get off their nono. Bum. Today the government tried a little more finesse in their encouragement. Their He Potama Rangatahi initiative was set up by the previous government to target youth unemployment in the regions. The new government is backing it by injecting 13 million new dollars into it. I spoke to Employment Minister Willie Jackson while he was visiting a youth employment initiative in West Auckland called Kiwi Can Do. Where's the money going, I asked him. It's, it's been put up to assist um, communities 
and particularly organisations uh, who know they can help with the needs at the moment. You know, people who are not in, in employment, education, and training. The focus is the regions at the moment, John. That's that's the focus. Um, where you know, and, and we're only scraping the surface because you know thousands of needs are out here in the the West Aucklands and in the South Aucklands. But we have to make a we, we have to make an attempt to support what's happening in our, in our communities. Otherwise, the communities have been forgotten and the National Party didn't do anything uh, and we want to do something and we treat uh, employment. This is not just about unemployment, this is about employment. And at the end of the day, we want to see young people uh, being resourced, supported and in meaningful uh, and, and in dignified uh, jobs. And, uh, and so I'm really pleased that the 13 million is, is it's a start. It's a, it's a start in terms of what we want to do uh, in the employment space. You talk about dignity and the dignity of labour and the sense of purpose and self-worth that you have if you have a job, if you get up in the morning and go to work. How do you impart that message to the sorts of kids that Shane Jones was talking about in the north who are disconnected even from that kind of possibility? <laughs> You, you support organisations who know these kids, mate. You support community uh, groups who've been working with these kids and you, and you wrap services around these kids. You don't just give up on them or you don't just uh, say, see you later if they've missed a day in terms of work. Some of these young people don't know how to work a job. They, they, they come from intergenerational unemployment. Some of them, their, 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 their fathers haven't worked for uh, for the last 20, uh, well, they haven't worked for, for years, and then their fathers, that's what we're talking about. So there's no easy fix here, but we have to work with the people who know the people, who know these young ones, who know the families. And, and so we can't have a, a punitive approach, uh, John. We have to be a caring uh, government, and Prime Minister Ardern has, has been saying that. Uh, we want to be a government that cares, that supports. It's easy to say, it's easy to take the hard edge uh, approach, oh, if they don't uh, come to work next week or one of Shane's nephews doesn't come to work next week, well, we'll kick them off their benefit or we'll get rid of them. Shane knows that's not the way. Shane is just uh, feeling the frustration that we all have, you know? Do we have to apply a bit of tough love sometimes? Absolutely. I, I have a history of tough love, uh, John. You know, I've worked in South Auckland at the coalface. But this is about supporting groups community organisations uh, who know how to wrap services around young people, who, who know their background, who know their families, and it's also about supporting employers who are saying, you know, we can't fill the vacancies here, you know, we advertise and we don't get anyone coming in. So we're trying a twofold strategy here and, and, and I'm really encouraged by what I'm hearing from the, from the different communities. I intend to go on a, a tour from mid-February on, visiting the different townships uh, and supporting and resourcing uh, organisations as much as I can. You talk about the organisations uh, that you want to support and you talk about the organisations who are able to work with these kids who are already one way or another connected to them. Who are they? What, are, what, what sort of organisations are you talking about? I, well, well, you know, it's not fair for me to, you know, I've got a list of organisations and it's not fair for me to mention those organisations now, John, because the next minute those people will expect funding straight away. We've got a whole list of organisations, if you know the, the North and if you know the Hawke's Bay and the East Coast, um, who we've worked with, uh, with uh, their different people who have had a history of working with young people, Māori, women, uh, at the coalface. But uh, I'm not going to mention any uh, organisations uh, now because then I think that would compromise, um, compromise us and also compromise some of those organisations. So I just have to be fair here. But, but organisations who've been working at the coalface, on top of that, later on, John, I want to set up uh, a reference group with people from those organisations, people from the employer groups, people from the unions, uh, uh, ITAs. I, 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 we need to have a, a real sensible conversation 
about the employment strategy in this country. We're just scratching the surface with this. This is just a, well, this is a good start, and we're scratching the surface, uh, surface in terms of uh, needs in, um, in the regions. But there's 81,000 of them, and we've got a, a crisis happening within the whole employment argument. Willie Jackson, if you left school in year nine, we're going to stick with this. If your dad's in a gang or in prison or simply not around, if mum's struggling with drugs or just getting by, you may find it tough to make your way in the world. But those are the facts of life for many young people in Northland, uh, the sort of thing Willie Jackson, Shane Jones have been talking about. So the government's plan to tackle youth unemployment in the regions is being warmly welcomed in places like Whangarei. Our Northland reporter Lois Williams called in at the city's youth space today to ask what they make of the $13 million being put into their he, sorry, he Potama Rangatahi project. She spoke to two young men, the government classes as NEETS, Zephaniah Gardner, who's 18, left school a while back and he'd love a job so far, he's had no luck. And he likes the sound of the pastoral care being promised for young people in his position. He's trying to find a job, but trying my hardest. It'd be pretty good if I see a lot of young youth like me get into jobs. And... Did you finish school? No, I think I got to year nine. Would you want to go back and do more? What would you like to do? Yeah, I would like to, but it's all about finding a job now. I just really want to put my life on the right track. don't want to get on the wrong track. What would help you do that? Just see a lot of support from people, even though that, yeah, a lot of youth space gives us support, yeah. So the government's got this new program about to start where it's looking at giving a lot of pastoral care, a lot of coaching, mentoring for individual young people. How helpful do you reckon that would be for you? That'd be pretty cool because then I could see a lot of young youth make it in life instead of going the wrong way and it'd just make it better for everyone. What sort of job would you like to have? Building. I'd rather be a builder and make homes for everyone so people where they feel safe and where they want to live and spend the rest of their life. That's Zephaniah Gardner. 18-year-old Asa Elepeni is the first member of his whānau to finish high school. He's a trustee at the youth space and at 18 he's the youngest student ever accepted for North Tech's social work degree. Congratulations Arthur Eli. He credits his mum and the youth space staff for getting him to that point and he says if he pōtama rangatahi can deliver the same sort of nurture it'll change things radically for many young people in the north. I think the initiative the um, government is putting in place is important. I think that's great. It's really beneficial for a lot of us, our young people. It's giving us a chance to get our foot in the doors. It's really shown that how much our young people matter. I have a lot of people, a lot of friends that have given up on their journey at school because of lack of guidance, not, not enough support. When they do go through these tough times, they are going to think that they are alone. They are going to think that they are not important, that well, with Whangarei Youth Space, we actually try and help with those people. I want, I'm going for a bachelor degree in social work so I can help give back to my people and try and show our, show our identity that we are more than what, we are individuals, we're not statistics, you know, we're capable individuals and we're capable of uplifting the mana of our tūpuna. That's us at Eli Pene. Uh, the manager of Whangarei Space, Youth Space, sorry, Bernie Burrell, says the previous government had some good youth employment projects. He Potama Rangatahi is one of them. This government has decided to put more money into it. She says the crucial ingredient is one-on-one -on -one support for young people in limbo. This government will take a look at it with fresh eyes, which is great, perhaps fresh energy, and they're, they're going to build on what's already in place. Mm. How crucial is that pastoral care element, do you think, in getting a young person um, back into training or work? I think that's really significant. You know, we see here at Whangarei Youth Space young people that need a strong advocate walking alongside them. We can see that the difference that that makes. And for a lot of young people, they may not have that one adult in their environment that is an advocate that has their back all the time. And for a lot of our young people, that one adult of significance is a youth worker. Um, so yeah, right behind anything that is going to make a difference to those young people.
That's the manager of Whangarei's youth space, Bernie Burrell, speaking, uh, as were the other two people in those tracks to our Northern reporter, Lois Williams, 90 minutes past six. A ban on single-use plastic bags and polystyrene takeaway boxes in Vanuatu is being billed as a benefit not only to the environment but the local economy as well. Vanuatu's government is responding to a study conducted last year that showed the main island had a huge amount of plastic litter in the coastal marine environment. Sela Jane Hopgood has more. Vanuatu's government has agreed to stop single-use plastic bags being imported and manufactured in the country by the end of this month. The head of Maritime and Ocean Affairs, Tony Tevi, says Vanuatu's new oceans policy prioritises the need to deal with the extensive amount of plastic waste at sea. Another government put in place an oceans policy last year. We felt that we weren't managing our ocean as we should be, given the challenges that we've faced so far in the ocean in terms of resources and also the fact that there's a lot of rubbish in the sea now. Mr Tevi says the government is looking at the broader picture. The challenge here was what sort of plastic do we really want to do that first and then others later maybe. That report sort of helped us identify which ones are the most plastic which are found in the sea. We realised, OK, there's a lot of polystyrene takeaway boxes and there was also plastics like single-use plastics just along the beach within the shores. A manager at the supermarket chain Obun Marche, Wendy Melenamu, says the ban will require a big shift in mindset for shoppers. Well, I would agree if it to be banned. Just to think that it's going to take a while for new Vanuatu people to be absorbed in that uh, new idea of carrying their own bag into the shop to do their shopping. A retail assistant from Funkui Duty Free in Port Vila told RNZ Pacific that they are still using single-use plastic bags. We hope to have single-use plastic bags not in use by March. This is good because it promotes the use of traditional baskets when shopping. CEO of Vanuatu Environmental Science Society, Christina Shaw, says Vanuatu is in a good position as it is tackling the issue before it gets drastic. We're seeing the same problem everywhere else in the world as are starting to affect Vanuatu now. So hopefully we can learn the lessons that have been learned elsewhere and not let it get to the stage where it has got in places where the beaches are polluted with plastic rubbish. Our beaches here are mostly still quite clean, but we don't want to have to get to that stage before we then try and address the problem. Dr Shaw says it's about getting new Vanuatu into the habit of thinking about the environmental impact of the daily plastic waste. There's a lot of food and drink related litter that people just unwrap what they're eating and drop it in the street. So making that learning to not dispose of things like that be a great improvement. Also, is it necessary to have water in a plastic bottle? The water is above WHO standards, so there's no reason to drink bottled water. And if you do, maybe you should have a reusable bottle. Companies and retailers are to be given a grace period of six months to use up their current stock of single-use plastic bags and polystyrene takeaway boxes. This is Sally Jane Hopgood. Sally Jane, part of the excellent RNZ Pacific team. It's coming up to 23 minutes past six. We're going to end tonight where we began with the weather. Pretty serious stuff at the top of the program. Uh, we've been looking at it a lot this week. On Wednesday, we looked at the big picture with Dr. Judy, Judy Lawrence looking at climate change and its impact on how we live, where we live, what we do and what we grow. That interview is now available online, uh, by the way. This week, the talk has been very much on temperatures, central Otago, 30 degrees plus and heading uh, a lot higher next week. But as far as we could ascertain, there was an hour or two this morning when the hottest part of New Zealand, it wasn't in central Otago, it was in the central North Island, Taumaranui to be precise, which raced up to 30, then above pretty early in the day today. So we did what we do when we want to talk to locals, we phone a cafe. Uh, those of you who are regular listeners will know Checkpoint's Cafe Chat, and in this case, it was Big Mama's. Big Mama's Cafe, Brooke speaking. Brooke, hello. Brooke, it's John Campbell from Radio New Zealand in Auckland. How are you? Good, thank you. Yeah, good. What's the weather like there? It's pretty hot. <laughs> how, how long have you lived in Taumaranui for? For two years now. And, and is this the hottest you've ever had? Um, yes, it is. Yeah, and how busy are you? 
and we're pretty busy at the moment. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Brooke. It's a stupid time to call and ask dumb questions about the weather. Who is, Brooke, who is Big Mama? Big Mama is my boss. Is, is, is she there? She's not here at the moment. B B Bama, are, are any, have you got any good locals in your cafe? Um, yes, we do. You couldn't grab me one, could you? Who have you got there? Do you know? Um, I'll just have a look, all right? OK, thanks, Brooke. Thank you very much. Lovely to talk to you, Brooke. I've actually got John Campbell on the phone. Speak to a local, and I thought you could be... Because you're always here, you yep. know everyone. Oh, Mr Campbell, I might say hello to him. <laughs> Hi, Mr Campbell. Hello, who's this? Yes, hello. Um, my name's Francis Ferguson, I'm the local uh, reporter here. You're with, you're with the Ruapehu uh, press, aren't yes. you, Francis? Yes, Rua I Pehu. am, I am, with Fairfax I know, Media. I, yeah, I know I your know work. You. Yes, <laughs> you've covered a few of my stories. So How are you? I am very good, thank you. Are you having, what are you doing, having brunch or lunch, or what are you no, doing? No, what I do is I meet the community, because we have no office, so I'm usually here between 10 and 12 at the local cafe. You're joking. And, just, uh, just, yeah, so just, I just have a two hours, and the community can come and chat with me. About what, just about life? Oh, anything, you know, if there's any news, or there's, um, you know, sometimes they want to place adverts or classifieds, but usually for, for news, we just have a bit of a chat. You spend two hours a morning in the local cafe, what a wonderful thing to do. What, what, oh, that, yes. Well, that's, that's I bet you get the that stories. That's, yeah. that's, what, that's why we follow your work up, Francis, because you've got your yeah. ear to the oh. ground. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. So, um, yeah, so were you, who were you wanting to chat with? Well, I just wanted to talk to someone about the weather because we were looking and the hottest place in New Zealand at the moment is Taumaranui. Oh, and I don't yeah. think that happens very often. No, no, I, no, no. And I'm not local local, but I know that local people would be able to tell you that because I've been talking to them myself. But I'll pass you on to Anahira because she's local and she can give you a rundown on, on the weather and and all that type of information. Is that OK? Yeah, beautiful. Hey, Francis, yep. keep up Great. your really thank good you. work. What a lovely oh, way to work a as a journalist. Thank you. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Yes. OK, I you love take your, care. Um, show on Radio New Zealand. Well, th well, the, feedback. well the feeling's <laughs> mutual. Thank you. Oh, great. Take cheers, care. Bye -bye. cheers. Kia ora, Anahira speaking. Kia ora, Anahira. John Campbell from Radio New Zealand. How are you? Yeah, good, thank uh, you. Good, good. Are you a local, Anahira? Yes, I am. How long have you lived there for? Um, nearly 25 to yeah, 28 years. Yeah, that, that makes you local. And, 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 yeah. do you, and do you work at Big Mamas or are you a customer at Big Mamas? Um, a very good supporter <laughs> of a very awesome, awesome <laughs> local cafe. What, what's, what's your favourite kai there? What's your favourite meal? I actually come in here for these smoothies, but they have awesome breakfasts. Oh, the meals are very local, very hearty. Um, meals that everyone likes. Yeah, delicious. Yes, it's absolutely beautiful. And, and Big Mamas has got a good atmosphere. Yeah, I can hear it in the background. It sounds delightful. And so in 25... Smells or... good. Can you Ooh. smell it? <laughs> no, I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> in, tw in 25 to 28 years in Tauranui, how often has it been this hot? Because it doesn't get that hot in central, the central around there, does it? In the central North Island? Well, well, I must say it's very hot here in the gully, um, in the valley, and, and everyone's sweating. We're all trying to find fans, and, well, at Big Mamas it's nice and cool. They can open all their doors, and the atmosphere's great. The locals are in there, and uh, it's very hot. I must say, very hot. Can, has it been this hot very often before in the quarter of a century you've lived there? Well, um, I remember once when I first moved here, but no, not, not as this bad. I haven't felt it like this before. Will you be going for a swim later? There's, where would you go for a dip? There's a, school, there's a swimming pool there, isn't there? There's a municipal pool yeah, there. Got, yeah. Um, yeah, we've got a local swimming pool in town. That's where the kids hang out. Otherwise, we've got the Wanganui River. Oh, yeah, and we've got the Ohura River and we've got the Ungarui River. So whatever river's the closest to wherever <laughs> you belong to in this area. Do but mostly have... all the kids go down to the Wanganui River and, and swim and play in the channels. Oh, lovely. Oh, absolutely. Well, well, it's really nice to talk to you. Enjoy the heat. And, and, and uh, if you have a swim the river, think of me. I couldn't think of anything nicer than that. It sounds fantastic. Oh, you're just going to have to come down, John, and come and jump in there with us. <laughs> I'd love it. Really <laughs> nice to talk to you. Thank you so much, Anahira. You have a good day. Yeah, you too. Take care. Bye-bye. Ka kite. Ka kite.
Anahira from Big Mama's Cafe. Before that, the phone was just being passed around. Love you. I'm told their fried breakfasts are a thing of joy and wonder. Not entirely convinced. Breakfasts, I'm not entirely convinced they'd get the, uh, the National Heart Foundation tick. But from what we've seen on Facebook, they look magnificent. Anyway, that was a lovely way to end checkpoint for tonight. Uh, cafe calls. We, we, we did one in Gore too, where the people just answer the phone. Oh yes, yeah, and just pass us around. Absolutely delightful the response you get in smaller town New Zealand. Uh, that is checkpoint for this week. On behalf of our really fantastic team, let's have a shot of the control room in there. There's no air conditioning working uh, in in this part of the building, so it's about 207 degrees in there. Uh, where Pip and Rangi and Kelvin and Ben are, and it's about 497 degrees in here where I am. Maybe a slight overstay, but, <laughs> but not much. Uh, thank you for being with us. Have a wonderful weekend, and we will see you Monday night uh, at 5. RNZ News Headlines at 6.30. Health officials and the chief coroner have warned people to take extra care during the ongoing heat wave. Severe thunderstorms are bringing heavy rain to Bay of Plenty. The government has tightened restrictions on areas affected by Cody dieback. A developer has been jailed for two and a half months for killing seven large native trees in Waiwera, north of Auckland. And the Children's Minister has announced $27 million in extra funding for Oranga Tamariki. Our next news and weather is at seven. Country Life's back for the year this week with growers of gnarly, temperamental heirloom tomatoes. If you look in a seed catalogue, every plant will be described as something beautiful and unique and luscious and delicious and... With big fruit and big maximum flavour and... and... strong yield and good growth habits and <laughs> easy picking. I've yet to read in a seed catalogue where it says, this one grows like crap, don't plant it. Country Life, 